Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. Welcome to r slash pro revenge. The place where we get to see some of the best revenge stories found on the internet. And this first post by user slash Jeremy R. Cork is also a crossover with r slash tree law. So you know this one's gonna be good and involve a whole lot of money. Background information. We live in an old and big manor that's been split into three attached houses. The houses are around 150 years old and were built around five huge giant sequoias, which were about 200 years old. In the UK, giant sequoias are very rare and the two in our garden up the house price by about 60,000 pounds. We live next to two really nice neighbors, one young couple and one old couple. The story, unfortunately, our old neighbors passed away. So their child and her family moved in. Let's call her Joe. Joe was instantly a pain in the butt. We'd been sharing chickens with the previous neighbors and Joe agreed to keep sharing them. However, on her nights, she would constantly forget to put them away, so we would have to check them every night anyway. One night, her little brats thought it would be funny to open our personal duck pen in the night, which leads to a mass slaughter. Later, the chickens went the same way. About two years ago, there was a storm and one of her sequoias somehow fell over and died. They were distraught, understandably, but from then on, the jealousy started. She would constantly complain about how lucky we were to have two sequoias in our garden and how our sequoia was making too much shade in their garden. It wasn't. Anyway, we just thought it was Joe being a pain. There were a few dry threats, like they'll chop it down or maybe the next storm will blow it down. Until we came back from a holiday to France to find a huge six meter stump and nothing else. I mean, how the F do you get rid of a 100 foot tree in like two weeks? Two of our old British oak trees had been crushed as well. My mum and sisters were crying, my dad was red in the face, and we had no evidence Joe had done it. She claimed that there had been a storm and she had to get rid of it. We had a security camera at the front of the house, but you can get it in the back if you go through a few fields. We were then given an £8,000 bill for damages to her property and to have the tree chopped up and removed, the wood alone would have been worth a small fortune. We had all lost hope and two weeks had passed when my dad came running in from the garden. We had put up a wildlife camera a few months ago and it had caught everything. We got a lawyer on the phone and started our revenge. We got a tree surgeon out who said it was an original specimen put into the UK in 1860. Along with the two that were in Elveston Castle Country Park, there were 218 around the UK, but only 60 now. He also told us to call out an engineer because the roots might be in the foundation, so when they rot, it could damage the house. Turns out, we would need to redo the foundation. Then we took Joe to court and sued them for damage to property, trespassing and lots of other smaller claims. The tree would cost 250000 to have another sequoia that was 200 years put in and looked after. Plus the damage to the foundation, which was 200 grand, and the two oaks, which were another 25k. So, with the smaller claims, it went to about 500,000 pounds. 700,000 USD. They had to move out. And we've now paid off the mortgages, done a lovely lot and kitchen conversion, and have basically done up the house and garden. As well as plant a 60-year-old sequoia tree in the back garden. We also had our kitchen counter and table made from the old sequoia. We now have a new lovely family living next to us who share chickens, ducks and pygmy goats with us. They were very nice and I make a fortune babysitting their kids. Sorry for the essay. Moral of the story kids, don't chop down other people's trees, it tends to cost a lot of money. And here's our next post by user slash call me swellington. This is a long tale but it's also a textbook case of why you don't abuse loyal associates. My spouse was the second person hired at a consulting company in a very specialized industry. In her 15 years with the firm, it grew to a respectable three office, eight to 10 employees at each location entity. She and Viona grew the business on the contacts, expertise and presentation of my wife. To the extent that my wife's abilities and education were the main reason new business came through the door. Over the years, her scope of responsibility grew so that the owner was basically 75% absent and mostly unaware of day-to-day -day activity. As he got more and more removed from the business, he would make overtures that he would eventually retire and sell her the business. 
He was so dependent on her generating income that he took out a life insurance policy on her. I didn't involve myself too much, but at a major industry dinner party I attended with her, he introduced my wife to the table as My Girl Friday, basically a secretary, which was weird. Over the years, she tried to get an agreement in place to buy the firm, even if it was years away. He always delayed and made promises, but never followed through. I told her, this guy doesn't respect you or your contribution. He'll never sell you the business because there is no reason to. He can make more money by stringing you along. And essentially, you're the business. Why would he sell it to you? One day, out of the blue, my wife received a raised in bonus, a very minor amount of money, and a contract that included a non-compete, non-disclosure agreement. After reading it, she realized that the owner was trying to lock her down from leaving for another firm. She'd been getting feelers from other companies. To make things even more suspicious, she received a call from a competitor who said they were in final stages of due diligence and they wanted to meet her. The butthole was selling the company and didn't think to tell her or ask if she was interested in buying it. She ignored the agreement and there were no other agreements in place. She was totally three. My wife is extremely loyal, but she has missed so many special days working for this guy, stuck around when they were wobbly, even skipped paychecks when there were tough financial times. She was furious, the absolute maddest I've ever seen her. We discussed starting her own firm and I asked how much business is contractually obligated to stay if you leave. It turned out that most agreements were either handshakes or 30 day at will. I also asked how many would leave with you. She said about 75%, including her biggest source of revenue who didn't even know the owner. In a very short time, my wife took a three week vacation. She had months of unused time. During which time she rented an office in the same building and made all the arrangement to set up a new shop. She agreed to leave any and all company property behind and to do her best to give the old company no obvious ammo for litigation. She called her clients and said, I'm leaving. If you want to look into relocating your account with my new company, you'll need to quit the old one before we can discuss it. Most understood the implication. While she was on vacation, she received a panicked call from her boss. We lost XYZ company. Do you know anything about it? She said, I'm sorry, but I just sent you an email. I've resigned. All my keys and company stuff is on my desk. Bye bye. The new firm took basically 90% of the business and seamlessly transitioned into the same company as it was before, but with a new owner. Even most of the office staff would come aboard. Within a year, her old company closed down, except for the small office her old boss ran. She sees him once in a while and he just scowls at her. So I guess don't mess with your best employees or you might be in a little bit of trouble. And here's our next post by user slash Rowan Winterlace. My 2019 was wild, but with everything finally on the up and up, I feel I can tell this story here. After uni, late 2018, I fell on rough times and was forced to move back to my hometown. I tried to transfer my job to a branch in my area, but failed, thus I needed to get a new job. I settled for a 20 hour a week job at the bookies, with a second bartending job in the evenings. The bookies is the target for my revenge, which was entirely accidental. Involved are the following, Janelle, my manager's manager, Shay, my manager, George and Gordon, my co-workers, and Kara, a co-worker at another store who's relevant later. I ended up working behind the counter as a customer service manager, basically a step up from a cashier. It's fancy when seen on a CV, but there's nothing really to it. I took bets, chatted with customers, helped people with machines, and for the majority of my shift, sat around waiting for something to do. I got on well with my co-workers, or so I thought, and had no major issues. It was 20 hours a week, but about one pound more than minimum wage, with a lot of overtime required of me and irregular shift patterns. Though I had no issue with my job, beyond how difficult it was to juggle the schedules of both my jobs, in February of 2019, after working for the company for six months, I was invited to a probation hearing. It cannot be emphasized enough that it was a probation hearing, in which I would have my performance reviewed and, as informed in training, was entitled to a pay rise at the end of it. I arrived that morning to a disciplinary hearing, where without even a shred of evidence, I was accused of 11 different cash discrepancies dating back to early November of 2018, shortly after I'd started, which all amounted to £271.36, all but one of which I'd never heard of before. These had apparently been reported and logged by my manager, Shay. 
and my co-workers, despite no one saying a word to me at all. Not a whisper in the five months this had apparently been occurring. I was told that it was unacceptable. A call made to HR and I was terminated on the spot and forced to hand over my keys and to never set foot in the store again. To my protests, I was told the decision could not be appealed and I would eventually receive written communication of my employment termination in the post. I didn't let myself slump around and feel sorry for myself. So on the way home, I opened up Indeed and applied for a bunch of jobs. And before I arrived home, had an interview set up for the next week at what is my current place of work. Now I was furious. Fuming at having gone to what I thought should have been a normal probation meeting and having effectively been called a thief and been banned for life from a place I'd never go to anyway. But somehow, my parents were angrier and ordered me to let them know when they got into contact with me again. Almost two weeks later, I received an email from the company's HR, which reiterated the accusations and stated again that I was terminated. My mom sat me down in her kitchen and walked me through a letter response that was two parts professional and three parts scathing. Ripping into them about their unprofessional conduct, their ludicrous claims, their lack of evidence, the holes in their story because there were quite a few. And finally, the cherry on the cake, the employment laws they'd broken. Now, I didn't want much, just a nice reference. A promise that not a whisper of these accusations would turn up when my new job asked them for a reference, because by then I'd already been offered the job. I then attached the letter to an email to fire back at their HR department. Then I added Janelle's work email. Then her boss's email. And finally, the holding company that owned the brand, because I wanted to make sure this was seen. A bit of background, the bookies I worked for is a brand that's owned by an international company. Their name, behind the scenes, is slapped on everything, and they pretty much dictate everything we did. I'm not sure if holding company is the correct term, but I'll stick with that for now. Anyway, I sent this email with a 48 hour window for a response. I received a reply the next day from the same email that my demands were being met. I smirked victoriously and moved on with my life. Happy to wash my hands with the entire ordeal. However, I'd set off a chain reaction that I wouldn't know about until three months later. Three months on, I'd settled into my new job, a call center position with double the hours and well over double the pay. I'd gone through the training and was settling into my new position when I see a new set of trainees settling in near my team. Among them was Gordon, one of my co-workers from the bookies. I was stunned. Gordon had been at the bookies for six years when I joined. He was well liked, good at his job and a favorite of the managers. There was no way he'd been fired. Though I didn't really want to talk to him as I was of the impression that he, George and my manager had likely set me up, I did want to know what happened. Luckily, on seeing me in the break room one shift, he sought me out and told me everything. Apparently, my email had been read by the higher ups in the holding company and had caused a lot of scrutiny to fall onto the bookies in our town, of which there were three in our area that Janelle was responsible for, two in my town and a third in a neighboring one. Someone in HR passed a message down to the area manager, Janelle's boss, claiming that they wanted to investigate and that they wanted results yesterday, causing him to drop everything and descend on our little town with the panic and aggression of a man whose superiors were watching his every breath. He went to Janelle wanting to know why he hadn't been made aware previously that I was apparently stealing money, why I'd been given keys to the shop and shifts on my own when allegations of that nature were attributed to me, and why I hadn't been put under investigation. Turns out Janelle had in fact put in my employee file that I was under investigation, but had never actually gone through with any of the official procedures for monitoring and investigating me. Thus, she'd fired me for the accused crime without looking into it at all, falsely claiming otherwise. Thus, the area manager took the dates and amounts of the cash discrepancies, confirmed that they'd been reported on those days without my knowledge in Shay's own logbook on the shop's cash, and sent that information onto our security team to investigate. Another little detail is that the CCTV for every shop in the brand is outsourced to a private security company who monitors each shop remotely and has access to all the cameras and video. 
As was procedure, they looked into the dates mentioned to see if I'd been doing anything untoward. I know I wasn't, and nothing was ever said to me. But they did find something. Turns out, money was going missing from the shop. But, surprise, surprise, it wasn't me, but George and Shay. They not only set me up for reasons I'll never know, but they were also falsifying numbers and cash checks on the system to hide us. One thing Shay was caught doing was deliberately shortchanging customers by taking portions of their winnings without them even knowing it. Bear in mind, a lot of our customers were elderly men and women. Gordon claims that he once opened the shop after I and Shay had closed the night before and noticed a cash difference, but he'd been told not to say anything to me as I was under investigation and it could compromise it. He did apologize and I let it go. Needless to say, George and Shay were fired, but it doesn't end there. Our team was small, including me, there was a total of four people working at the store. As they hadn't been able to hire anyone to replace me, George and Shay's termination meant Gordon was the only employee at the busiest shop in our area. Even if they'd been able to get other colleagues from the two other shops to help out, it wouldn't have been enough to keep the shop open and manage the amount of customers. So they closed the location down until they could get the staff to run it. It was at that point that Gordon handed in his resignation and applied for his job at my work, meaning they had no one. On top of that, Gordon's girlfriend worked in the same shop as Janelle, and she relayed that she was rarely at their other store in the other town for the next few weeks before the area manager reported she was fired as well. No reason given to her. I was later issued an apology for everything by the area manager, and informed that she, Janelle, was no longer with the company in an email sometime later. But somehow, it doesn't end there. With the store I worked at closed, this one being on the high street and where most people preferred to go. The only other location in town was the much smaller location in the suburbs. For one, where Kara worked. Alone. She suddenly received an influx of customers into her tiny store space. And absolutely no support from other staff or upper management. Thus, for her own mental health, having already been overworked and underpaid, running an entire store by herself, she quit. Meaning that location had to be closed down too. All of this at the worst possible time, March, when the Cheltenham Festival was occurring, which is a huge moneymaker for the gambling industry, even in a small town like ours. An opportunity that the three other bookies on the high street reaped the benefits of instead of my old place, as the former customers went to them instead. As it currently stands, just over a year later, both shops remain closed, and I'm currently entering a job in cybersecurity, the training for which I paid for with my current job. Thanks for firing me, jerks. You did me a favor. And this is what I look for in Pro Revenge. They fired him, and he made sure they were all fired and couldn't get another job. And guys, I think that story will be the last one for today. I hope you all enjoyed, and if you did, make sure to subscribe to the channel for edit videos three times every single week. But with that said, that is it from me. I hope you all enjoyed, and all I want to do is see you all here next time. See you later, guys.